I sent yeah. little passages from what you did to friends, and they said, you picked the perfect narrator. This <laughs> man, he's, he's got so many nuances to his voice and can do so many different voices, so easily slipping between one and the other. And and you had a sort of creepy uh, quality the way you did did the the evil uh what's his name uh on the the runes story oh yeah yeah you really yeah. did you, you <laughs> yeah. had it i don't know what it is but it was creepy after glancing at the ticket inside carswell uttered the hoped for response yes it is much obliged to you sir and he placed it in his breast pocket Next, a moment later, Carswell re-entered the compartment. As he did, Dunning managed he knew not how to suppress the tremble in his voice and handed him the ticket case. May I give you this, sir? I believe it is yours. Even in the few moments that remained, moments of tense anxiety, for he knew not to what a premature finding of the paper might lead. Both men noticed that the carriage seemed to darken about them and grow warmer, that Carswell was fidgety and oppressed, that he drew the heap of loose coats near to him and cast it back as if it repelled him. Gary W. Atkins, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Fine. How are you, Graham? Good very, to see very you. good. Good to see you at last. This is the first time we've actually spoken or seen each other because it was all emails and messages as we were doing the book. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a kick, actually, because <laughs> I really was impressed with your narration abilities. And it, I mean, I can see why you have so many fans, Graham, because you can <laughs> get it. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a, a lovely book to do. Uh, it was two stories, ghost stories as well, which are always, they're always great, you know. To, I, I really enjoy yeah. doing ghost stories because you can bring all the, the drama and the tension and the suspense and all that to the story. And they're just lovely to read. But these are really quite old stories, aren't they? Oh, yeah. These are uh, published around 1906. Excuse me. I got the... Can you still hear me, Graham? I can hear you, I think Gary. They were yeah. published. Yeah. Early 1900s, and uh, both by M.R. James, Montague James, when it, he was a librarian at Cambridge for a very long time, and one of the great writers of supernatural stories, shall we say. So how, how did you, probably you read get, a lot of this. How yeah. did you get to be the bloke then that gets to, to publish them and, and also turn them into audiobooks? Well... I had done a blog sometime past. These stories were both in the public domain, both in England and here. And, and a few years ago, I did a, a blog and, you know, published them there. So I had the, you know, rights to publish. Yeah. Otherwise, Amazon would not have allowed it. <laughs> right. Which is yeah. good for me. Because I really wanted to make a, you know, audible audio book out of it. That was the whole purpose of putting it online and you have to have it online in order to publish an audio book. Yeah. Via Amazon anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so you went for it. So how, how's yeah, the, I went for it. yeah. And you enjoyed the process of turning it into an audio book then? Cause it's, I, th I always think it's yeah. a fun process cause the thing grows gradually and you, I do it, th I do it in stages and, and let you check through. You, you enjoyed that. Okay. Was that, did that work? It was, yeah, I love that 15 minute um, sample we do it, you know, you know, after a little while there. And, and that's just amazing, amazing process. And you yeah. can hear everything really clearly. You've got a, a, your own studio set up there. So obviously you are on a high level of uh, narrators. A lot of them don't have anything like that, you know. Well, I started out when I started doing audiobooks a couple of years back. I did the first 50 books in my wardrobe. <laughs> I, mean, oh. I mean, I soundproofed oh, and everything, but yeah. now it is a, it is a purpose-built studio I've had built in the home because this, for me, this is, you know, after almost 30 years in radio to then, I took this up when the pandemic hit and uh, for this has just taken off. And I, I love doing this now more than I love doing radio. And I loved radio. Um, because yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's the, the variety of stuff I do, you know, it's right. It's from, you know, children's books to scientific journals. I, to, I noticed that. Yeah. I yeah. Don't, I, I, it's like a hundred different books you've done now. Yeah. Over yeah. hundred. Yeah. It's, it's closing in on 150, but the, the variety and the range. And then I meet authors from all over the world as well and rights holders and publishers. And so the people I've met have been yeah. fascinating. And, and you're in Springfield, you know, Springfield, Illinois. Right. Um, home of Lincoln, which you know because you visited uh, uh, this city one time, you said. And it's, um, you know, it's a good place to concentrate on your work. Springfield, good place to raise children or concentrate on your work. There's not a whole lot to do compared to where you are, Graham. But well, that's you okay. know. Where I am is a, is a small town, north, we're about 40, maybe 30, 30, between 30, I think it's about 37 miles north of London. So it's only 35 yeah. minutes on the train to get right into central London. But the actual town, it's only really a small town. It's not that different to Springfield, I reckon, Hitchin, where we are. Um, uh, my view of Springfield. If we only had good rail service in Springfield, it would be a lot more similar. <laughs> <laughs> because well, our, our rails, even though... It's it's better than it used to be. It's still not up to your standards. <laughs> well, I, I like Springfield. We went there. I'll be honest with you. We went there by accident because I was telling you earlier, when I was in radio, I used to go to uh, radio conventions in the U.S. sometimes as often as twice a year. And I started out by going yeah. to different you know cities like Los Angeles and New York and Atlanta and Dallas and uh, Minneapolis and they said I, mean, I used to, to go to the cities and sometimes my wife would come with me and we'd have a little holiday there at the same time but then I decided it would be more fun to fly to somewhere that's not the city where the convention is and to drive to the convention across country wow. so on one of them well, yeah, there was yeah there was a convention in huh. Chicago so we flew to Memphis and we drove to Chicago straight north and Good that, choice. Yeah. that is when we stopped in Springfield. Like we, we, we were on the main road and I said, Springfield. So, okay, let's go and have a look at Springfield because it's the state capital. We thought, you know, have a look. So we drove in yeah. and then we see this sign and it says Lincoln's tomb. And I'm like, is that Abraham Lincoln's tomb? Is it? Why is that not? It, it is. It yeah. is. So we went to Lincoln's tomb. And yeah, <laughs> we and we saw Lincoln's tomb and the, the history and all the rest of it. And there's a park ranger there, and a park ranger said something to me. This was way before Britain brexited, but he said something to me that made me understand why I'm against Brexit. And I think you know, us being a dinky little island on our own is a big mistake, and not joining with a huge, you know, continent yeah. of different countries. Yeah. Um. Although there are challenges to that. I said to this park ranger, I said, tell me, why is Abraham Lincoln such a big deal? Because he wasn't the first president and, you know, he didn't bring in the civil rights thing. You know, why is Lincoln such a big deal? And this ranger said to me, because he kept the union together. And I said, OK, he said, yeah, he said, you the United States is a powerful force in the world because all the states are united. He said, South America is all these little individual countries. So they're not as strong as the United States. There are a lot of poor countries in South America, whereas the United States together yeah. were better together. And that's exactly what the EU is. It's everybody together. And, you know, and so yeah. th thanks to Abraham Lincoln and my visit to Springfield, it kind of crystallized that for me, why it's such a big deal. But we became... That's exactly... Yeah, the right answer. He, yeah, I mean that's true. That's that, yeah, even he, Lincoln would have said that was his, his accomplishment, his great well, accomplishment. Well, well, probably. the cool thing is, the cool thing is that on another convention that was in, funnily enough, in Chicago, we decided to do another road trip, and we'd already driven, you know, Memphis to Chicago. So we did a higgledy piggledy trip, trip which involved going to Canada and Niagara Falls and Pennsylvania and. Um, Michigan, and we we and ended up in New York, um, but and I think we flew into Chicago and flew out of New York, um, and on that trip, we we decided to learn more about Lincoln, but we found that he was following us. We went to the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, 
And not only did we see right. the the car that Kennedy was shot in, which turned out to be a Lincoln, they've got the chair yes. where Lincoln was was shot is there. And we also went to Washington and we went to Ford Theater and we went to obviously the Lincoln Memorial. But another thing happened on that trip, just like we were, I think I needed a pee and we stopped in a place called Westfield, New York. And there's a statue of Lincoln there with a little girl. So I asked the guy in the little antique shop just there, why is there a statue of Abraham Lincoln and a little girl? And it was, um, she, his train had stopped there when he was campaigning and she had spoken to him and said he'd look better with a beard. And that's why he the grew beard the beard. Story. Yeah. I knew and you then, were going there. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That. So it's a well known story. It wasn't to us. And then we were in the Lincoln Memorial, and there's a book about this very story. And Julie bought the book, and we became really big fans of Abraham Lincoln. And it's all because we went, we, we stopped in Springfield, yeah. and it, it kicked it all off for us because he was a hell He's of a, a guy. He's a legendary character, too, because he yeah. was the best lawyer in the state at the time that he was yeah. elected president. But but he was kind of a backwoodsman and had never been to college. He he was self-taught. I mean, he read books. He walked miles to borrow a book. You know, all these stories that pertain to him are just legendary. The kind of things that would make anybody a legend. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, yeah. He returned he returned the books too right on time when he <laughs> So I mean his character was never in doubt. They didn't that call was... him honest Abe for nothing, did they? No, they didn't. <laughs> But I, so I'm very proud to be from here. And I also think you should you should come and see the Presidential Museum, which is more like Disney, a Disney presentation. I mean, it's very, you know, modern museum style, you know. with uh, And is that part of the of, Capitol building? Is that there? No, no, it's, uh, near, it's near there, though. It's near the old state Capitol building where Lincoln gave his house divided speech, maybe his second most well-known speech. Yeah, and that building stands, and it's it's awesome to to visit too. I mean, it, oh, we'll have you, to go back. Right on, on we have to go board. back. Yeah, I'll have to find an audio book narrator convention that I can go to, and I'm sure they exist. And I'll have to find oh, one that's that's around I that bet. way. Yeah, because it only has to be I'll close. And, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it yeah. only has to St. be close. Louis or we'll, Chicago. Yeah, or Kansas City. Yeah, it'll be there somewhere. You're yeah, right. yeah, I'll go back because so we really like. We met the nicest people on that trip. We stayed in a little place called Perryvale, Illinois. Do you know where? The, do you know that at all? Heard of? It. I don't yeah. know it. No. Even I think it's I only got a population. A I think it's only got a population of a couple of hundred. And I can remember we stayed in the motel, and because we didn't book motels, we just stayed wherever we we decided. Well, should we just stay here tonight on this on these trips that we did? And uh, yeah. I was in the motel and I said to the lady behind the counter, I said, what is there to do in town tonight? And she said, oh, I think they're showing a movie at the local community center. And I said, great, we'll go to that. And we watched the Queen Latifah film. But we met like really nice people in, in you know, because yeah. we've been to the U.S. and we've been in, you know, New York isn't known for its nice people, which is maybe unfair because there are nice people there. Yes. But the that's, people we met in the more rural, the smaller towns were much, much nicer and much friendlier. Or, or we were a yeah, bigger novelty. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, you said Perryville. Perryville, you said, right? That's right. Yeah. Perryville. That was probably yeah. in Perry County. I know where that is. Yeah. So. Right. It's only a very small town, but it was in Illinois. It was definitely in Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. And that was on that well, trip. Well, I'm glad the Cubs are not trying to buy your footballers away <laughs> I, according to what i read in the daily mail the other day uh it's not not happening so that's good i'm, I'm very happy about that we don't want to you know have him sell off your best players like he did with us <laughs> is that what he did to the cubs eh? if the cubs hadn't been through enough yeah 160 right. years of pain or whatever it was before they won that 26 without a champion but they did win back to back that before they went on that scheme <laughs> right okay so it, and that's just the way it is you're very lucky in such a big group of of teams you know that you've won that many championships that liverpool has won 19 championships yeah that, yeah out of yeah what, every year there's like 36 playing is that right for the i mean that's incredible well, You've there's twenty that. there's twenty teams in in the in the top flight now. There used to be twenty two, but three go up and three okay. go down every season. 
So the amount of teams that will go through it over its hundred and odd years of existence is a lot. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's incredible. That's like the Yankees in baseball. Yeah. You know, they're the only team that I can think of in over here. That's had a comparable record. Right. So, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I but, love Liverpool. It's the closest thing I have to a religion is my fanaticism of Liverpool football. Club. I, I think it's a very cool thing. And I think it's a cool logo you've got there too, with the liver the li- bird. The liver bird, yeah. The liver, liver bird, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's based, I, mean, I, I don't know, Liverpool Waterfront has a building called the the Liver Building, which is was the home of Royal Liver oh. Insurance. And there are two of these ah. liver birds. One looks out to sea and one of them looks into the town. And so they always say it's a male and a female pair. And the female is looking right. out to sea, looking for mariners returning from a voyage, looking for a wisp of smoke <laughs> from a funnel, maybe just to make sure they made it safely yeah. home. And they reckon the male looks into the town to see if the pubs are open yet. And that's, <laughs> that's, so that's, that's the two. And what, so it's, they've got a live bird on, on the, pretty on the uh, awesome, uh, pretty awesome <laughs> legend there. That's good. That's very nice. Yeah. If you go to Liverpool, you'll be able to see the live birds with one looking out to sea and one looking into the town right on the waterfront. Yeah. It's a really good looking look. skyline. If yeah. you ever visit Liverpool. I always, I always admired Liverpool anyway, because being a Beatles fan my whole life since, before high school, I yeah. just, you know, naturally feel an affinity for that place. And I would go visit. That would be one of the first places I would visit would be well, to see where those guys together. I used to have a regular radio show on BBC Radio Merseyside, which is the local BBC station for Liverpool. The studio's right in the middle of the city centre in Hanover Street. And, and while I was there the last time, I haven't worked up there for about four years, but uh, when I was there the last time, there's a book came out by um what is his name it's 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 called tune in and it's a very very a detailed account of the beatles early years and it's a very famous book it's a very famous writer but i forget his name now and uh anyway in this book he says and it was something i'd never read before that uh, john lennon used to wash dishes in the restaurant at Liverpool Airport when he was 14. It was one of his first jobs. It was a Saturday job. And my mind blew because when I was 14, I used to wash dishes in the Argyle restaurant in Liverpool Airport. It was my first ever Saturday job. And I'm like, my God, I I had John Lennon's old job. That That's the job I did. And then, Yeah, that's incredible. And to, but to compound you it. You shared some of, yeah. To, to wow. compound it, though, that that airport is, is now old Liverpool Airport. They built a new airport just down the road. The, and the new airport yeah. is called John Lennon Airport, right? So they oh named God. the airport after the bloke that washed the dishes there. Washed so they've set a precedent. So when they, when they build the next airport, they'll have to name it after me. Because... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is so incredible. Yeah. Nobody else can can get that a uh, feeling of having worked where he worked either because they yeah. tore down the old place. Well, no, so the, well, the old cool. building is still there. It's a hotel now. The building oh, is still there, but it's not an well, airport anymore. They probably anymore. still have people working there d- washing dishes. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I I worked in the Argyle, Argyle restaurant. Yeah. So did you grow up in Springfield? <laughs> yes, I did, and I returned here. Um, I actually went away to college to uh, Virginia for a year. And I studied with a British writer, a writer in residence. I studied creative writing with Richard Adams, the fellow who wrote Watership Down, most famous yes. of his books. But, yes, uh, yes. So you studied with so, Richard Adams. Yeah, I did uh, uh, for, uh, for one year. And how it was, was he? It was fabulous. How he was he was already one of my favorite writers, and he was a real nice guy. I really, I really got along with him great. I mean, and he would uh, actually make coffee for it. He would say, do you want a cup of tea? Or I guess you Americans might prefer coffee. And, of course, we did. <laughs> but we had, uh, you know, regular, like, weekly uh, tutorials, you might say, as well as a class with him. So it was, it was definitely fun. Wow. He's one of my favorite writers, as I say. I mean, I, I had just finished reading Watership Down, and then I 
heard he was going to be there and I applied and was lucky enough to get in. Wow, you went wow. there because of him. That is so cool. Yeah. That is really, really cool. So when you were a kid growing up, what kind of stuff were you reading? Well, I, I think science fiction, fantasy, horror. I especially liked, um, lo you know, H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe were my favorites. I hadn't read M.R. James yet, but M.R. James is, you know, in a different way. He's right there with Poe, and I would say, much better, of course, much better writers. Both of them are much better writers than Lovecraft. But I, that being sophomoric as a child, I really liked Lovecraft's. Uh, you know, yeah. he he wrote some pretty scary stuff, like the rats in the walls, and some things that just you know even hold up pretty well today. The, these two but books, like that, these two M. R. James books that you've combined in in the two horror tales that 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 you've got out that that you got me to narrate. They are yeah. really, really well done. There is a, I don't know how he's done it, but there is a, an atmosphere that almost, that you can almost smell like, you know, that, that, that kind of really old kind of wooden leathery kind of, you know, that kind of, how do you think he got that across? Yeah. Cause it's not in the words, it's in between the words. Yeah, because I I was right. feeling it as as I you know when I read them I try to get I try to get everything across that the things trying to get across and it was just so easy with these because they they really had that you know they they started out by saying you know the the main character especially in the first book he's the he's the university lecturer and and it's talking about the environment he's in and then he goes on this trip and then he has this experience but there is just this wonderful it's almost. It's almost there's a there's a calm to it because it's it's not it's not fast like that it's not like a a horror shock 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 it just gently unfolds like a a warm leather armchair or a or a you know with a that yeah. that that kind That's of so wood true. smell and, and I do do you know how he's done that? No, I don't think I don't think it could be explained. I think it has to be something. <laughs> The same thing happens when you listen to a good song, like uh, I'm thinking of Bob Dylan's lyrics. Yeah, yeah. He can transport you away, and it's all in, in between the lines. The lines are part of it, but there is a subtext. It's an atmosphere. It. It's an atmosphere he creates yeah. in it. And it's not just because yeah. they transport you back to a time, because they're just as relevant now, I'm sure, as they were then. You know, as far as moving Absolutely. you emotionally, it's it's not that. Yeah. It's not that because they. It's not like they, they they read as old. It's because they read atmospherically, with this this yeah. gentle unfolding of this the the story. And the second book as well. There's 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 major elements of that. So there's the same vibe in both of them. So uh, it was right, I think, for you to to put them together. Did you do much work? Did you change yeah. them very much from the original text? I did very little. Yeah, I did. I did less with those than any of my other things because they're so tightly written, and I just tried to update. Make you know, there were some cases where the word a word may no longer even be spelled that way or exist at you know yeah. as such. And I did yeah. some of that kind of update, but other than that, I don't think I. Did anything? Maybe I maybe I shortened a bit because it was intended to be read. Yeah. Aloud. It on was my blog. So I, I was using it on a blog originally. Yeah. You know, verbal. It was read out loud though, so you know. Yeah. And the the writer creates a, a world though is what we're talking about earlier. What you're just saying, and that's one thing I learned from Richard Adams is, and it's kind of ineffable. It's not something. You, you you have to create another world, yeah. If you're especially if you're writing fantasy, but if you're writing a, a horror story too, because that clearly you know, as far as we know, nobody has um, you know been devoured by a monster because of uh, you know, yeah, a slip of paper slipping through their fingers. Uh, yes, runic yes. Sim full of runic symbols. But in this yeah. case, something horrible happened to that man and. Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, we won't. We won't say too much. No, about no, it. no. Don't, no, like don't give it away. And, and I must say, horror. you know, particularly for the first one, uh, the the whistle one, um, 
I when I researched it online, there were a number of television adaptations. There may even be a movie, I don't know, but there's certainly BBC television adaptations made in the in the sixties and I decided not to watch them because I didn't I wanted it to be based on the words. But uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's yeah, a great I decided, idea. <laughs> I decided not to watch because otherwise I didn't want the, to because I I could see how the characters how I thought the characters should sound and should be and I didn't want me to be trying to do the characters I'd seen in the in the TV adaptation you know so yeah what do you got going there you got a cat going on there who's that no that's my dog uh, that's oh. Oliver the dog he said uh, hello Oliver Shih Tzu. oh Shih Tzu yeah oh, is Oliver a good dog he's not getting enough attention though are you mate oh no he's not <laughs> he says I'm, I'm starting to get hungry so <laughs> you know that's probably what he's well, we well we won't go <laughs> yes, we won't go yeah. we we won't go too long. So now okay, apart from fine. apart from not... apart from these two books, now you and I have done another book together. Do you want to quickly talk about that one? Yes, um, we've got another book by uh, Blackwood, and Algernon Blackwood called The Willows. Of course. I haven't I haven't really pushed that forward yet much on Amazon. You'd be hard pressed to find it, but when I advertise it coming up, you'll be able to find it and uh, look for it because, I mean, you could look for it now. And actually, if you do a search by Graham Mack, I think you might be able to find it. Okay. Well, so, as well as that, if you send me after you finish, if you send me links to it, I'll put the links in the description, and obviously I'll put them on my website oh, as well. But if you, you know, if you catch this wherever you catch this on YouTube, and obviously I'll put links to uh, the two, uh, the two horror tales from M. R. James that we we're talking about. I'll put all the links yeah. to everything in the description, so you can click on them. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the U. K., the U. S., or anywhere in the world. I'll put the Audible links and the Amazon links and everything you need. And, and yeah, you sent okay. me the, the ones for that yeah. one too. We'll do you that. Also, you've also done a book that you wrote, a book of riddles, haven't you? Yeah, uh, it's just out a month ago or so. It's called uh, Riddle Me These Kids. Um, excl exclamation point at the end of the book title. I don't know if that's necessary to find it or not, but. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, well, uh, if I, that was I'll my find first one. I'll find it. Before I'll put links you. in the description to this too. So if you want, you want to get on that oh, one. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, great. I appreciate it. What's this you're doing with a, a Colombian? What are you doing with a Colombian composer? What's that all about? Uh, we're doing a book of music instruction. Since I worked in the field of education, I'm interested in that, and and I think this kind of Musical education is goes way beyond musical notations. The the traditional, it it tries to get kids at an early age to get interested in music, and it really seems to work in terms of producing, you know, serious musicians and people who can improvise, for example. Right, right. Can you teach and that's that? Something that's missing. Yeah, I know it's hard. You would think that wouldn't <laughs> be possible, but I think if you get people at an early age. When yeah. they don't know, it sounds impossible. <laughs> yeah, they can learn yeah. that. Yeah, that, and you, you, you say be... <laughs> you say you worked in education for a while. What what were you doing? Well, I actually worked at the Illinois Association of School Boards mm -hmm. for thirty two years. So, <laughs> and um, we were helping school boards, you know, keep democracy alive at the lowest level almost, of governance in the United States. So I'm pretty happy these days because democracy seems like it's going to survive in this country. There was some doubt for a while. Well, it wasn't that long ago. It was the midterms, wasn't it? Um, I, uh, yeah. I I catch a podcast every week of Bill Maher from his TV show. They they put an audio podcast of the TV show, and I and I listened to that, and yeah, he was really sad. worried that, that it was going to go horribly wrong for democracy in the united states but it seems like the people showed up when they needed to and they turned yep. out uh, and they they cast their vote and they they headed it off at the pass and and, and in yeah, fact it was yeah but but i think for the democrats because normally midterms the incumbent gets a hard time anyway but it wasn't as bad as it really could have been even it was actually quite no it was quite good in the end for the for the democrats yeah as as good as you could have imagined that it would actually go i mean there was almost no chance they could hold on to the house for another you know two years yeah because 
the demographics just didn't allow for it. There, there's a lot of gerrymandering in districts. Yes. In states held by red, especially where they have a red governor, red state governor, and a, you know, I yeah. shouldn't act like red is a bit. I know the Reds is the name of your favorite football. No, or, but so. I know exactly. I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean because. Yes. Uh, we're not, we're not, you'd be hard pressed to find any fans of Trump on this side of the Atlantic, really hard pressed. That's, um, that's we what really, I think. we'd yeah. really don't understand the, the, that whole, that whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense to us here, you know, because we have, you know, things that some people in the United States think are an abomination. Things like you know gun control and socialized medicine. Well, and, you know, we, that... and most of us over here that have a brain in our head wish we had <laughs> your system for, for that, yeah. and also a parliamentary system would be nice, so we could get rid of somebody like Trump when he gets in there, because yeah, that was a nightmare. Stuck for four years. Do you think he? I mean, he says he'll run again. Um, is there yeah, anything that can stop to, him running? I think he's going to be edged out by his own party. He's already okay. signed. So there's a lot of a lot of their leaders have pretty much backed anybody else but him. Is pretty much so. it. It seems to so me. I, I think that's best hope. Yeah. yeah it seems to Go me ahead. though, whichever whichever branch of politics you lean to, that there's an extreme at one end and there's an extreme at the other end. You know, the extreme right or the extreme left. And the answers yeah. lie somewhere in the middle, somewhere. You know, you need, you need the social right. conscience, the social yeah. conscience of you know that the that the, the government has a, a duty to look after the most vulnerable in society. You need that, but you also need to be friendly towards business. But then you need some kind of regulation because some yeah. of them can, you know. See, you need you need bits of everything, and the answer lies somewhere in the middle. The extremes, both ends of the extremes, are very, very dangerous. But when something isn't yes. working, or it, it, something's, you know, people are having a hard time, you get these politicians who then, from one of the extremes, who then blame the problem on the other side and say that their extreme is the answer when the extreme has never been the answer. We fought a world war <laughs> over, you know, stuff like yeah, that, know. you know, it, it, it's always, my father it's, seemed to understand that because he supported Eisenhower a Republican. My dad was a big Democrat, but when Eisenhower, you know, ran, he, he liked his less extreme views than yes. the Democrat. So yeah, Adley Stevens, a great man, but you know, good, good as governor in yeah. Illinois, but yeah, possibly that, would have been overmatched with the Russian situation at the time. Yes, but it I, I, it is a shame that people fall for it, and that's what happened here with Brexit, because you know people who were you know struggling to get a doctor's appointment or whatever it turns out to be. Um, or were out of work, unlikely as that is, because we had the lowest unemployment figures just before uh, Brexit, even though, you know, the pro-Brexit people were saying, you can't get a job because all these immigrants are coming in, taking all the jobs. Well, they can't be. We've got the lowest unemployment figures. It just can't actually be that way. But yeah, people but people were are... sold that, were sold that as the reason is because of all these Europeans coming in. And it wasn't the case. And now there's a job shortage here. They can't get people in jobs like uh, hospitality and running hotels and bars and picking fruit and all that. They, they, they just, the people aren't here anymore that were, the, that were here to do that. And now we've got, you know, the yeah. opposite problem. Is, but it was sold, that, yeah. Brexit was sold as the answer. And I guarantee all the people who thought their life was not, they, they weren't living a, f a fulfilling life because of we were in the EU. I bet their life is no better now that we're out of it. Yeah, you know, there's no well, that way. was true of what Trump Trump sold us a similar kinds of things, and he didn't deliver on any of it. And you know, it's surprising people still. I think it's it's incredible people still stay with him. You know, a lot of his audience just won't stop believing it because, well, mass communication. We saw that was a problem in Hitler's day. I mean, it's it's a very powerful thing, and he comes across as a comedian, kind of like W. C. Fields was in the 1930s. I don't know if you've ever seen any of his stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, but it very likable uh, scoundrel. I mean, everybody knows he's a scoundrel, but 
they they seem to think, well, that's okay. That's how the super wealthy are. You know, they, they think he's like a cartoon character. Um, there's a Disney character, Uncle Scrooge. Yeah. That I, I think it, it is the closest I can come to that type of thing. Yeah. Where you feel some affection for him, even though he's, you know, just he owns everything and he rolls in his money in his vault and, <laughs> you know, he just kind kind of mistreats everybody, but still. A lot of people just won't, you know, turn their back on and say, that's enough. You, you know, you haven't done me any good. You promised all this stuff and didn't deliver on any of it. Yeah, yeah. We need so, another Lincoln from Springfield. Springfield was pretty good in those days. <laughs> it <laughs> came through when we needed it, for sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. my father was my father was a big Lincoln fan. And I think probably that's why his family moved here from Kentucky. Like, right. that's where because Lincoln, Lincoln was... moved to Springfield from Kentucky, didn't he? Yes. Uh huh. And I thought, I think when his when his father died, I think his mother said, "Well, we're going to move. You know, we're going to leave the state. We can't run the farm anymore." They were grew up on an apple farm, so you know, he felt he felt that was a pretty idyllic thing. But they had a, a log cabin that he he actually lived in a log cabin, and he. You know, family members have gone back. I, I have a picture of that somewhere. I, I will have to find it and send it to you. But he, he grew up in a log cabin, and the snow would filter down through the cracks in in the roof during the winter. They didn't get a lot of snow. He did say that. But, you know, wow. this is... So that's a proper kind of U.S. background you've got then from, you know, that's because that's a proper American story of, 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 you know, of somebody going out there and taming the land and, and doing that and building the cabin and all the rest of it. But your ancestors are actually yeah. British, aren't they? Yeah, uh, we're like 85% British, according to a DNA study my brother had done and he told me about. So I'm, I'm you know, basing it on that. But I think I'm pretty sure those are pretty accurate. So, yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of ancestors from England, a little bit Irish. You know, you just if you go back far enough, we're all related. <laughs> you know, if you go well, if you if go back really... far enough, you'll you'll find Viking and Roman and Normans in there as well. You know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you guys would know about that. I mean, geez, they they pretty much. I mean, the Romans that was part of Rome, right? Right. I mean, Britain, Britain, Brittany, or whatever they called it uh, in those days. Yeah, all the way up, yeah. all the way up to just before Scotland, and and the Romans who had who had conquered every nation they'd faced up to that point, they got up to Scotland and yeah. went, whoa, no, like build a wall. <laughs> They're all mad up there. Yeah, build the wall. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they never took Scotland. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Hadrian's Wall. There's still pretty much a lot of it is still there. I understand it. Yeah, it is. I visited. I lived up up that way for, on the border. Not, not well, actually near. It was in Newcastle upon Tyne. I worked at a radio station, Newcastle upon Tyne, which is only like a few miles from Hadrian's Wall and where the border of Scotland used to be. And yeah, and they must have yeah. been a wild people if the Romans just went, whoa, if the greatest fighting force the world had ever assembled went, no, they're too much, put a wall up. <laughs> <Too much. laughs> like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, well, I think Scotland is pretty interesting, though. My, my wife went to England when she was in college, uh, my late wife. I'm a widower just this year. Oh, and, uh, goodness me. Sorry to hear but that. But she really liked she really liked Britain a lot. She liked uh, London. She was mostly in London and yeah. lived with uh, people. Uh, uh, the husband was an illustrator for album covers, which wow. I wish I knew him now because yeah, <laughs> like he did um, Pink Floyd and some other album covers, and I thought, wow, that's incredible. What wow, a job. Do you know which Pink Floyd <laughs> albums he did? No, I don't recall. I mean, I might be able to look it up in the letters. Because they're all while, iconic. She was, yeah, I mean, we sent each other letters a lot when she was living in Virginia and I was living here. So I'll have to check. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were great. Those were great covers, I know. I was a big Pink Floyd fan from about 1967 or, or 8, something like that. I know they started probably around 63, if I recall correctly. Yeah. But anyway, you know. Yeah. We, yeah. When, sorry about that. You probably heard that. 
Yeah, no, um, well, so, it's, it's just it's just good to know how how far British influence has gone. Um, but you decided not to take up cricket; you went with baseball, which is you know, it's it's yeah, basically a well, variation of rounders, isn't it? Which we all play as kids at school. We we have four bases yeah, in rounders. Yeah. It's more of a square than a diamond. Yeah. Yeah, it's more cutthroat than than that. <laughs> <laughs> what well, baseball? Yeah, it's, it's a children's game. Yeah, baseball is. I mean, people like the stolen base record was set by a guy named Ty Cobb, who was known to spike people with very sharp metal spikes. Oh, really? And that's how I mean, he got that record because people were afraid to try to tag him out. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I mean, that just shows the kind of level of, you know, evil competitiveness that <laughs> this sport well, you know, the fans develop. get the fans get pretty into it as well. I remember that first game I went to, which was the Braves and the Dodgers at Turner Field, and I found myself there was a there was a run out there, but I thought he'd got to the base, and I was shouting with everyone else, "He was safe! He was safe!" <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, you it just does get that. It. it really gets you into it. yeah, it draws you in, especially if it's a. I always go to the rivalry games with St. Louis and Chicago because that's I'm closest to that sta stadium in St. Which, Louis, which is pretty Saint, good. One. Oh, so St. Louis is closer to you than Chicago, even though St. Louis is in yeah. Missouri. Yeah. Yeah, it's twice as close. It's about a hundred miles. Okay. And if we had good rail service, I'd, I'd be down there all the time, but it's not. <laughs> well, we drove. There's we drove. After Springfield, when we kept going, we we the next place I think we stopped. Oh, I can't remember what, how how later it was but we stayed in st louis and we went up the arch up the jefferson wow. memorial yeah, we went up that, there that's kind of yeah. kind of a trip that's a little frightening not, it's not exactly like going up the elevator is it <laughs> no it's a little rattly train thing that that just takes yeah. you into the thing and then when you get up there the windows are this big it's like looking out of a plane right. window it, but it's a little square, little tiny windows in the top of the arch. But how the thing stays up on its own, I still haven't worked out. There's no guy wires or anything. It's just an arch. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that either. I mean, the, th the thing is, they like all arches, or a lot of arches, it was put in place from both ends, brought, you know, good good engineering because they had to get them to, to meet in the middle, and they put the, you know, the top piece on. Yeah, with a crane, which I've seen, you know, I've seen pictures of it, but it's an impressive. It's not memorial. something you think would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is was a pretty br brilliant idea, but it's nothing like the Eiffel Tower, which I think is <laughs> is even more brilliant. I mean, yeah, not, not, you know, and you're closer to that, so I mean, that's pretty cool. Oh, I dr we've um, I think we've been to Paris, you know, quite a few times because you can just go on the train. It's, it's less than, I think it's only just really? two hours yeah. from London. Yeah. You go through the channel, you get on the, you basically get on the train oh, wow. here and you get on the train here in Hitchin, you get off at St. Pancras and it's the same station. You switch platforms and they have to go through the immigration thing now and all that. And then you get on another train uh -huh. and you're in Paris. And I think the whole trip from door to door is only like three, three and a half hours. We, from from where I am now, I could be in, as long as I timed the trains right, I could be in Paris in three hours. It's brilliant. Yeah. Wow. But, which is because I've, yeah. dri I've driven it. I've driven it. It was like um, when we first, we bought a, a sports car, or a Japanese, we bought a Mazda MX-5. And, uh, oh, you call uh -huh. them a Miata. And it was a, it was a yeah. brand new car. And I said to Julie, let's drive to Paris through the channel. So we drove to wow. Paris through the channel and of course, and we stayed in the Hilton at the Eiffel Tower. And we, we so I'm in my Very car, much. right? Yes, yes, you'd think, how romantic, you know, couple yeah. in a sports car, driving across France and, and, and going to stay by the Eiffel Tower, how great. But then you forget, this is a brand new car. This car's brand new. And all of a sudden, I'm in Parisian traffic. And that roundabout around the Arc de Triomphe with no markings, and it's a free for all. Yeah. And there's people on scooters, like and <laughs> and it's a brand new car. And the steering wheel's now on the wrong side, and you're driving on the opposite side of the road. And it was very, very oh exciting, more exciting than it should have yeah. been. Yeah, <laughs> you don't really want that kind of excitement. <laughs> no, do it's it like in a rental car. Do it in a rental car with automatic that. transmission. <laughs> if somebody bumps it, you've no. paid the excess. You know, do all that. But <laughs> oh, we had to do it in our own brand new car. But hey, but sounds was, like a rush. That would oh, it was it a must fun have made time. It even, 
even sweeter when you look back on it. Though. Those kind of things that go wrong, as long as yeah. nobody gets hurt. Nobody got hurt. It and it was lovely because the next stop, <laughs> then we then we drove up into the. Uh, no, I was on that trip. I forget we done. We've done a few couple of road trips. One of them we we drove up into the French Alps. It was winter, and uh, and we went skiing. Oh, nice. And then on uh, yeah. on another one, we drove into Italy. We we drove. Yeah, we drove, and then the Milan traffic was even worse. What <laughs> Italian drivers make the French look? Oh, it's just uh, yeah, but 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 fun it's stuff. It's funny there would be that much difference, but yeah, there can be. I mean, like Chicago, people drive right on the bumpers. Yeah, but I Smart noticed. Mind, anyway. I fa I found yeah. driving in the U.S. much much easier than driving in Europe. Because I was in a rental in the US and they're all automatic and the roads are really wide and there are hardly any roundabouts yeah. and it's all big intersections and you get in the cities and yeah, driving I, driving in New York is quite challenging. Yeah. Put that together for us. Yeah, that was a pretty good move. He he thought, well, this is for national defense. We'll build this interstate system and, and it really is. It does have big wide, you know, two lane highways going both directions. It, Everywhere yeah. in some places, you know, five lanes. I mean, in Los Angeles, it's, it's yeah. different. So I've driven yeah. out there, and that's kind of awesome because there's no late at night coming home from like the animal park. You know, you're driving, there's nobody on the road, and you got five lanes. <laughs> yeah. It's all lit up. It's yeah. The thing that, that always messed me up in Los Angeles was you you go like, uh, like we were staying, the convention I was in was at the, the airport hotel at the LAX. And one of the speakers who is a, a, a radio presenter as well called The Grease Man. He's worked all over the USA. And he said he was doing stand-up comedy in West Hollywood. And we kind of worked out where it was and we had this rental car. So we got in the car and we thought, oh, we'll drive out to West Hollywood and we'll go and see him at this comedy club and see, that, you know, he's on with other comedians. This will be good. We must have been on that freeway. Which one is it? Is it the 5 or whatever? I can't remember which, which one ever it, it, it is. We were on it for hours and we were moving it like, you, you know, you, you, you're just crawling along. If you're at the wrong time of day, like yeah. in the evening, you oh, know, yeah. we, you just, you just it's got it. It's brutal. It really, I've how people there. can live oh. like that, I don't know. Just, you know. They're just commuting into this, into Chicago, you know, because they don't have really good rail service. They have pretty good rail service, but nothing like what you have there. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's off putting. Yeah, I turned down a job one time to work for a power company that would have been a really good job, but I didn't want to commute into Chicago. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I like so, it as a I'm city though, Chicago. I mean, I've um, I've been to where Chess Studios used to be, where Chuck Berry and you know Willie Dixon and yeah. Howlin' Wolf and all those guys used to record, and I, and I like that vibe. And I went to Buddy Guy's Legends Club, and a really good friend yeah, of I've mine. Been there. You've been to Buddy Guy's Legends? Yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, you years blues. Ago, we fan? had an annual conference in Chicago, so yeah, I heard blues. It was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't and, recall and, uh, who was singing. Yeah, yeah. but uh, a really I good. I kind of music. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And and a, a really good friend of mine. He's also a radio hero of mine. Is from Chicago. His name's Jonathan Brandmeier. I don't know if you've ever heard of Johnny B. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah. yeah, he's he's I've heard real. Him. I've I'm a big radio fan, so, you know. Well, Jonathan you know, Brandmeier was a chi Chicago legend, and he's off the air at the moment, and it's a yeah. tragedy. And uh, I, I got an email wow, from I him. Wow, I didn't know he About three weeks ago, I got an email from him, and he's, he's had some health problems, but he's getting over it. And he's and he's, uh, I get emails from his brother as well, who I've never met. But, uh, yeah, uh, so we've got to one day get back to, to that part of the world and catch up with Johnny. And if we if we do that, we'll we'll come and see you in, in Springfield. Yeah. It sounds like we've got the Presidential yeah, Museum do. to do as well. Yeah. But right you, now... You would, love, you would love that museum. It's fascinating. Yeah. Great. Uh -huh. But right, yeah. right now, what's brought us together is this book by yes, M.R. Yeah. James, which is called... M.R. Uh, it's two horror stories by M.R. James, and they are great. Two horror uh, tales. Yeah. Two right. horror tales, oh, yeah. yes. Were they originally two? James. Were they two different books? Yes, they were. Uh, these are two of his most popular books. W one of them is called Casting the Runes, which a lot of people are familiar with. They made that into a film uh, by a French director named Tourneau. It was a very good film, except that they put the monster. The monster in it is 
like a guy in a rubber suit or something. It's, <laughs> it's not quite as convincing as you might do today with the, you know, the computer graphics that they have today. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but that's but you... the only failing in a great film. It's good. It's yeah. called, that one is called, uh, oh, I'm not sure it has runes in the title. No, I don't think it does. Yeah, night but... of something or other. It's, it's, it begins with the word night. And, right. And it's a pretty good film. It's like a, I'd say four, four out of five stars for that one. One of my yeah. favorites. But but the way to so really enjoy to... it, the way to really enjoy it though, Gary, <laughs> is to listen to the audio book. Because with the audio book, the pictures are better. You're absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's what people who grew up listening to radio enough know. There really yeah. is. Yeah, Pictures yeah. Are, are of your own creation, and it uses some of your own innate abilities. Yeah, so and, and, it, and some of your own, your own experience, which makes yeah. the tales even more frightening because you've put a little yeah. bit into them, a bit of you. And that's why ghost no stories make such great, great audio books, you know. Well, and, and actual I books too. Would like, yeah, but I thought you would like to to read that one. I knew that would be a good one to narrate for, you know, just for fun. I used to read aloud to my brothers and sisters some post stories, like the, what was the one about the guy that buried somebody under the floorboards? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, just some things that were really creepy, just to creep out my younger brothers and sisters. <laughs> So I, right. I enjoy that kind of, I've always enjoyed the horror stories, I suppose. Okay. Well, if you like this, or even if you're not into horror, because they're, they're so well written and so intricate, they're just great. They're great tales yeah. anyway. They're just great tales. And so there, it's, there's a Facebook group dedicated to Mr. James. I mean, yeah. I, I wanted to mention that because Mr. James is a really, really good writer. I mean, I think he's one of the world's best, probably the world's best ever for supernatural tales, um, maybe maybe uh, Poe is up there for something you might call horror tales. Yeah. But yeah. you know, Poe was educated in England, by the way. So, and that's where he got the ability to write poetry. I might say it didn't just you know that doesn't just happen. You have to get some early training. That's why my book about music. You should watch for that, everybody okay. out there. Yeah, and who and so so. I, I've got a really Who's the, who is yes. the Colombian composer you worked with that worked on with that? Her name is Maria Guzman, uh -huh. and she is a composer as well as a, you know she teaches music. She you know writes music and plays the piano and also plays a kind of drums. And if you've ever heard, I think it's called uh, a Peruvian drums, and that is like a box. You sit on this box and you tap it with your finger. And you can get sounds out of this thing that sound like a, a complete drum set, except for the cymbals. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've heard it, and it's an amazing thing. But I haven't heard her play it yet. I just know she plays that in clubs and things, probably. And okay, so watch for Maria. Yeah, because well, I think look she's out for that. Be a look out for that too. Yeah. And is that one out, or you're just working on that one now? We're, we're just working on that. We've got four chapters done on it. Hope to get it done by the first quarter of next year, probably. So you're a busy so, guy. Yeah, I'm doing a lot. I'm trying to keep busy, I think, because I'm, you know, alone here with my dog and and some cats. So <laughs> so we, we are keeping busy on other things and, and missing our, you know, companion. Yeah. Like my yeah. life's computer's gone. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm busy. I'm a busy man. <laughs> and, I, and I love that. I love uh, what I'm doing here is a lot of fun because I'm getting to meet people like you and I'm getting to <laughs> see these projects turn into something so wonderful is what you did for us here. This is Well, uh, thank you very much for, for letting me be the one to do it because, you know, it was an open audition oh. and I just took a punt and I liked them yeah. anyway. And I, I actually... I've spoken to narrators who hate doing auditions. I love doing auditions because you, you just don't know where they're going to take you That's and what they're going to do. Weird. And I just enjoy the process of it. And then I forget about them. And then if the author or the rights holder comes back and says, yeah, we'd like you to do it. I think, oh, it's a bonus. You know, I enjoy, yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy the work that writers well, do and, 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 and reading it out loud. It's just, 
it's just it's just a nice thing to do. It's it's, it's a. Well, I sent you know, little passages from what you did to friends, and they said, "You picked the perfect narrator. This <laughs> man, he's he's got so many nuances to his voice, and can do so many different voices, so easily slipping between one and the other, and and." You had a sort of creepy uh, quality the way you did did the the evil uh, what's his name uh, on the the runes story. Oh yeah, yeah, you really yeah. did. You, you <laughs> yeah. had it. I don't know what it is, but it was creepy. And I wondered how did you do that? I thought to myself, how does he do that? I is don't that... know, but I, th I think I think it's all done in the writing. The the because it speaks to me, and I go. Okay, and I read it, and I go, okay, I know how this guy, I know how this guy would sound, and then and then away I go, and and it's in it's in the writing, and you know, uh, all I'm doing yeah. is reading it out loud because the everything you need is in the, they're so well written, everything you need is on the page, could, you know. I could definitely believe that about M. R. James because I mean, just just incredibly well written stories. These these two are my favorites, and have always been my favorite. M.R. James stories, you know, he, but he wrote so many really good ghost and horror stories. You, you're going to have to get get a complete collection of his work. And read I'm going to. I have to. I have to. You would. Hey, love you it. never know. We might it's, turn more of them into into audio books. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, I think we will. I think. Yeah. I think uh, one of the stories in my next two story set is uh, an M.R. James story. Okay. Right. I All which right. One that, but, All yeah. right. Well, we'll do that. If we do that, and we'll 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 talk again when that one comes out. So so right now, Definitely. the one you've got to get is the the two. It's called Two Horror Tales by M. R. James. There are links in the description to everything you need and some of the other books we talked about too. So check that out there. And thank you once again for choosing me and continued success, Gary W. Well, it was last. I enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you, Graham. Thanks for having me.